I'm also pleased to welcome uh, Christopher Dylan Herbert. Christopher is an American baritone and musicologist who performs concerts, recitals, uh, and opera throughout the world. He's a two-time Grammy nominee in the chamber music small ensemble category. Uh, he's a gramophone award finalist in the field of early music. For 10 years, he's recorded and toured extensively um, with his ensemble, New York Polyphony. Chris produced Voices in the Wilderness, an album that includes the compositions of female composers of the Effort of Cloister, his topic for this evening. Uh, and he was recorded in the meeting house at the Cloister, uh, the original building where the music would have been uh, performed. So Christopher, welcome. And uh, tell us a little bit about the music of Effort of Cloister. Hi, Tom, and thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to speak to everybody tonight. Um, I am speaking to you uh, from about two and a half hours away from Lancaster in Wayne, New Jersey, where I teach at William Patterson University. So hence, if you're looking at the screen, you can see all this pipes on the pipes on the ceiling. This is my office. Um, so it's a little bit of a dungeon. That is not Ephrata at all. Um, I, I was able to uh, get into the music of Ephrata as a musician um, while I was doing my doctoral studies at the Juilliard School. And it led me down a very, very fun rabbit hole. And I got to meet a lot of wonderful people, a lot, a lot of whom are from Lancaster County. So um, I am just going to start launching into my presentation. I'm going to try to speak as slowly and clearly as I can. I have a lot of ground to cover. And I'm also going to play for you a few audio examples. And that's how we're going to start tonight. So I'm going to share my screen going in here and first i'm actually going to jump over to spotify if anybody wants to listen to this obviously i would love for you to buy my album at the cloister store but if you want to listen for free you can um this is uh the spotify page for voices in the wilderness the album and i'm just going to start off by playing a very little tiny snippet of the music of Ephrata for anybody who's never heard it before here we go <laughs> Okay, so that's just a tiny, tiny little snippet, and I'm not sure if you could hear it all that well on your end. Um, sometimes on Zoom, it doesn't always work the way we'd like to, but um, that's my hope. In any case, um, you can certainly go back and listen to more and um, I will share a bunch of links hopefully at the end if we have time so you can easily just link to that on your own on your own. But we're going to launch into the actual presentation. Um, and by the way, that recording uh, that I played for you, um, I made with a small group of singers at the Effort of Cloister in March of 2019. Uh, and we received a lot of good critical acclaim for the album. We were featured on um, NPR's Morning Edition back in J July 2020. Um, and uh, it's it's been a lot of fun to continue to talk about the music of Ephrata, which is homegrown American music that um, was largely slept under, under the rug for over a century. So here we are, the music of the Ephrata Cloister. A lot of you have been to the Ephrata Cloister, so I don't need to explain too much, but we'll do just a little quick uh, background um, on, on what we're looking at. So it's a historical site in the town of Ephrata in Lancaster County, as a lot of you know. It's administered by the Pennsylvania Historical and Museum Commission. And it was an important settlement during the 18th century. Here's our map of Lancaster County here on the left. Lancaster's in the center and Effort is to the northeast. And then if we continue to go on, here's the, sorry, here's the little uh, uh, zooming in on the map here. Effort is up here, the northeast corner of the county. And then a little brief history here. So it was founded in 1732 on the banks of the Cocalico River by this man named Conrad Beisel, who we're gonna talk about in a second. Um, and it was a pietist settlement. So this is uh, an offshoot of the Anabaptist movement in Germany. Um, a lot of the people that, that moved here were from either like Northern Switzerland, uh, Southern Rhine Valley area near Heidelberg. Um, and they, Beisel was a very charismatic leader and he uh, encouraged celibacy, communal living, Sabbatarianism, meaning that you worship the Sabbath on the Saturday and mysticism at the cloister. German was the dominant language there. And at its height in the 1750s, the community housed over 80 celibate men and women 
And then a community of about 200 people that were in families um, around the cloister known as householders, and they were non-celibate neighbors. Beisel died in 1768. A man named Peter Miller, Miller took leadership until he died in 1796. And the last known celibate sister died in 1813. So it, the, the community lasts one generation. Um, moving in here, Conrad Beisel, we have no pictures of him, uh, no portraits done. Uh, those are his dates, 1691 to 1768. And he's born uh, in what is today Germany. He converts to pietism in 1715 immigrates to Pennsylvania in 1720, and he had a lot of squabbles, religious polemic squabbles, um, at, with various uh, communities in Germantown and the Conestoga River Valley. So he decides to set up for his own uh, in 1732. He establishes Ephrata. Um, and he's charismatic. He's very unpredictable. Basically, what he decides tends to go at the settlement, um, but it doesn't come without its own squabbles. There were a lot of internal squabbles there. Um, moving on. My interest is in the music, and in order to understand the music, we need to understand what the actual materials were that they used in order to read music and understand music. So first, let's look at the text, because uh, if we're singing, we're singing, usually we're singing words, and all the music at, at effort is a cappella, so we have words and we have notes and rhythms. So, um, and as a singing teacher, that's basically all I tell my students to do is learn your words, then learn your rhythms, then learn your notes. So um, I'm basically being a rudimentary singing teacher to you all in some weird way. So the hymnals of Ephrata, like many Protestant religious communities, Ephrata used print text only hymnals containing the words of hymns for religious purposes. So this is very different from what we all know from going to church over the course of our lives. Um, if you've ever gone into a church and picked up a hymnal out of the back of a pew in front of you, it's going to look something like this. So for example, Come Down, O Love Divine is a hymn um, for Pentecost, and this is all in unison, and you see the words underneath the notes. It's very clear when you sing which word and, and which note it's on. It's a, it's a very clear way of setting text. It's easy to do with, with modern notation software. Well, we didn't have software back then, um, and notation was variable throughout throughout the world. So what you have here for a hymnal is this. We're missing the pitches. We're missing the rhythms. All we're seeing is the words. Kind of interesting. Um, this, by the way, is an effort a printed hymnal. It's the uh, Zionitische Weihrauchshügel of 1739, or the Zionitic Hill of Incense. And um, we'll get into what it is, the collection. But I just want to show you what it would look like. I'm zooming in. Before this hymn, which is, you can tell it starts with this capital letter, Der bittere Kelch und Mirren Weine, um, you can see above it, it says 12th, NEL period, and then Rein Christ soll ihm. So what that's telling us is that there's a, this hymn is supposed to be sung to melody number 12, which is affiliated with the text Rein Christ soll ihm. So, or maybe that's a kind. Yeah, it's a, uh, no, it's an R. Sorry. Oh, fine. So anyway, the um, the main point here is you would kind of know what that melody is, and then you'd look at the text and you'd sing that text to that melody. That's not something that we could do today in church because we don't have the same type of um, repetition, repetition, repetition that we had back then. So another way this would appear, sometimes you'll see it in handwriting. So here's another book from Ephrata. This is a 1766 imprint called the Paradisisches Wunderspiel. And here somebody wrote in what the melody was that goes with this particular hymn, Ach Gott wie mancher bitre Schmerz. So here it's melody and then it gives you the incipit of a melody that it wants you to, to sing along with this text. I know you, some of you might be scratching your heads right now. It's a little strange, um, but this is how music was practiced at the time. So what they did at Ephrata, in addition to having these texts, is um, they would write their own music, which we're going to get into. I just want to tell you first a little bit about how, where the texts came from and how they were printed. The first uh, Ephrata hymnals were printed by none other than Benjamin Franklin. Uh, he had a printing press. It was uh, the first one in the colony. And he printed three different titles, Göttliche Liebes und Lobes Getöne, 1730, Vorspiel der Neuen Welt, or Prelude to the New World, 1732, and then Jakob's Kampf und Ritterplatz, 1736. And this is the first time that you see the name of Ephrata appearing in print, was in, was in this hymnal. Um, 
what's amazing about all of these is these are collections of texts that are by European pietists and Ephrata residents, including Conrad Beisel. And Franklin is printing this not in Gothic typeface, but rather in a Latin typeface, which is unique for German books of this time, which would have been printed in Gothic. You can tell, like, it's very easy for you to read this on the right side here. It's, it just looks like normal lettering that we would know, which is the, the standard for English speaking world. What happens in 1739, oh, here's a Zooming in, you can see it's very, very clear for us to read as English speakers. So if you move on, in 1739, uh, Conrad Beisel and the Ephrata community decided to work with a different printer. And this is Christoph Zauer, who was in Germantown. He was a German speaker who was printing for the German community, as opposed to, to Franklin, who was, who was more ecumenical. So um, Zauer is, uh, he's prints in a Gothic German typeface, and this becomes the first book in the Western Hemisphere to be printed in German Gothic script. Um, it's called the Zionitische Wagrochshügel, or the Zionitic Hill of Incense, and it contains hymn texts written by inspirationists and pietists from Europe, the famous ones being Gottfried Arnold, Gerhard Terstegen, and Christian Friedrich Richter. Conrad Beisel also contributes a number of texts, and then he asks the brothers and sisters of Ephrata to write for the for this uh, hymnal. And some of the examples of these are Bruder Agonius, Bruder Obed, Schwester Ferben, Mutter Maria. So Brother Agonius, Brother Obed, Sister Ferben, or Phoebe, Mother Maria. Um, so men and women contributing texts to this particular text hymnal. And this is what it looks like. Here's the title page. Much more difficult for us to read as English speakers. German Gothic script is not what we're taught in school. Um, so for me, I had to kind of get to know, and sometimes I'll still second guess myself, what letter is that? Especially the capital letters can be hard to read. So you can see this is Zionitische, that's pretty easy. And then this is Hügel, beginning with a W, that's a W. Oda or Mürenberg or um, the hill, the mountain of myrrh. So this is an M and this is a B kind of hard to tell. Um, and then just to give you an example of the way it would look in the book, you could see, still have this melody indication here. So Herzog unsere Seligkeiten is the name of the hymn, and there's a melody that you would sing along with it, which is melody eins ist not. So you'd, I, ostensibly, you would know what the melody is to eins ist not, and you would apply it to this hymn. Okay, so moving on. Uh, that's the text. Oh, I'm going to, I think this is interesting. Um, it's, there's a lot of rhyme in this language. So I'm just going to read you the first four lines and listen to the rhymes. Herzog unsere Seligkeiten, Zeug uns in dein Heiligtum, da du uns die Stadt bereiten und du deines Namens Ruhm. See how it's very, very, if you ever studied Shakespeare growing up, you learned about iambic pentameter and trochaic tetrameter and uh, dactylic heptameter or whatever else. We have the same system here for uh, to apply to German uh, hymnody. And it gets very sing-songy, which makes it very applicable to musical settings. Okay, moving on. Here we go. So after that imprint in 1739, Ephrata acquired its own printing press, which was the third in the colony of Pennsylvania. And it, they called it the Druch der Bruderschaft, or the Press of the Brotherhood. It was established sometime in the middle of the 1740s. And what they did was they would print their own hymnals and they would print books for other groups as well, the most famous being a big a printing job of the Martyr's Mirror for Mennonite communities around. Um, but they also printed for their, themselves, and the most important of these is Das Gesang der Einsamen und Verlassenen Turteltaube, the one on the top. Um, they had print runs in 1747 and 1749. Um, this translates roughly as the song of the lonely and forgotten turtle dove. Um, the turtle dove, it can be a symbol for the community. It can also be a symbol for various religious th themes. Um, and to zoom in on what it looks like here, here we go. Das Gesang der Einsamen und Verlassenen Turteltaube, nämlich der christlichen Kirche, which means namely the Christian church. Um, and you see the date 1747. What's unique about this book is that the texts no longer include any European pietists. It's all exclusively offered by authored by Ephrata residents. So it's 
poetry and text written by Ephrata for Ephrata, and it was not to be disseminated outside the community. So it's really interesting that they're spending so much effort to create a number of religious books for worship that are only going to be used in this one place. Um, and I'm zooming in here. Another interesting thing about this particular hymnal is it includes a treatise, which is the first original treatise on music theory written in the, in what is today the United States. Um, and you can see it here. It says Singarbeit, or the work of singing. Um, singing doesn't mean necessarily like, ah, I'm singing. Um, it's more, all, singing also has to do with composition. So singing is a much more broad term than what we would use today in, in, in American English. Uh, it, again, uh, it's a fascinating read, um, and they created basically their own harmonic rules and their own composition rules. So Ephrata created its own homegrown compositional system that's very unique, and I spent a lot of time when I was doing my dissertation talking about the music theory. Um, I'm going to try to avoid that for today because it gets very, very esoteric and specific, and we want to avoid that type of discussion in a general lecture. Um, they also, um, here's what it looks like. Here's the first uh, hymn, Ach Gott wie manche bitre Schmerz. And I'm just going to read you some of the text to, so you can again hear the rhyme scheme. So this one is by Conrad Beisel. And you can tell, I'm just going to read the first four lines. Ach Gott wie manche bitre Schmerz durchdringet meinen Geist und Herz. Hier in dem Leib der Sterblichkeit auf meinem Weg zur Seligkeit. So the rhyme scheme is not as um, nuanced as the one I was reading to you before. It's much more direct. And in some ways it mirrors a lot of the Fraktur art that we see throughout Pennsylvania, um, the flourishing of Fraktur that we see throughout Pennsylvania, the Southeast Pennsylvania at the second half of the 18th century. Okay, um, moving on. So what about this music? Because I just talked a whole bunch of, about text and I didn't even mention any music. So what Ephrata was unique for was it became this hotbed of musical composition. All the music written at Ephrata was intended for use with the hymnals and all the music at Ephrata was for a cappella. There were no instruments used. And the Ephrata music theory system encouraged anybody in the community who wanted to compose to compose music. So it became a communal process and it becomes very interesting as a result. So because they had their own theory system, it's similar to European theory, but not exactly. And the reason it's similar, but not exactly, is because there's no known instance of any of the Ephrata residents having formal musical training. So they're taking what they might have remembered as growing up in Europe, and they're trying to apply it to this new system without much input from the outside. So what you see is this system that you kind of recognize as a musician, and for me as a historical music theorist, I can recognize it, but it's kind of in a, it's all jumbled into a different order, which makes it a very interesting study. Um, it's centered, instead of on the bass, like most Western theory, it's centered on the soprano. So it becomes if then. If you can write a soprano line, then you can harmonize that line according to a system that's almost like paint by number. So if the soprano is singing a C, then the alto would do an E and the tenor would sing an A and the bass would have an E. I'm just making something up as a rule here. Um, but basically that was it. If you had a melody that anybody could follow the rubric and just harmonize underneath. And it creates this quintessential effort of sound, which I'll play again at the end of this. Um, so you guys can hear it again. Um, what that looks like in practice, and again, here is the Zing Arbeit treatise, the singing work treatise. What that looks like in practice is this. In most of the music uh, manuscripts, at the very beginning, you're going to see these rule charts. Um, so what it says here in German is der vier Stimmen Schlüssel zu den Zeweisen. So the four voices within the chart of the mode of C, which we might translate today roughly as C major. And I've transcribed this into modern notation. So for any of you who are musicians, you can read it. And what you're going to see here on the top is the soprano basically doing a big C major arpeggio. Forget what comes to the, to the right of my, my mouse right now. I'm just looking for the first three measures. And underneath that, if say if the C is in the soprano, then the alto has a G. The tenor has an E and the bass has a G. And you harmonize accordingly. It's very interesting. Now, what I did is I, I, um, 
I translated into English. So the chart of the four voices and the mode of C. There's this other curious thing about how to raise the C that deals with if, if you flattened, you have to go up minor minor third, which is very nonsensical to me, but that's the system. And then there are these other four notes that you have in the mode of C. So for example, um, I've got a piano here. So if I have da 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 da, that's a C major scale. What I have here in the soprano line is da ba 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 ba. Nice little C major arpeggio. But what I'm missing are these four notes. So if ba 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 are all just C major triad notes, what I'm missing are da ba ba ba. And what they're showing on this side is how you harmonize those notes as well. So they're trying to account for any note that you might find within a particular mode or key and then harmonize accordingly. And what the effort of residents do is that. I've tried time and time again to disprove. I've tried to say, no, they don't do this. No, they really do this every single time. Um, and it creates this kind of this kind of um, still and a little bit stagnant feeling to the music because the, key, the keys never change. Okay, the music manuscripts. This is where it gets fun. So the music manuscripts were produced uh, in a scriptorium, which was run by the Ephrata sisters, and they're supposed to correspond to the printed hymnal. So you'd hold in one hand, you'd hold a printed hymnal, in another hand, you would hold a music manuscript, and you would be looking at both, potentially, to perform any given piece of music, because you need the text in one and the notes on the other. They're not putting them all into the same book. Um, and it's mostly three hymns per page. You can see there's one hymn goes from left to right, another one goes from left to right, another one goes from left to right. And then you also have a lot of frock tour style illuminations like this one, which is, which is done in relief with stippling. Um, just zooming in so you can see the detail. Gorgeous, these two turtle doves facing each other. These are tulips, um, some other flowers below it. And again, it's all done in relief. What's interesting here is you'll see this is page six, and then you have the title of a hymn, and then you have 55. 55 corresponds to page 55 in another book. So the way that goes in practice, I'll just give you an example. Oh, right. They had to create the, they created the music manuscripts. There are even firsthand accounts. I'm not going to read this one for the interest of time, but there are firsthand accounts of, of visitors going to the cloister um, and, and saying, oh, I saw the, the, the sisters producing music manuscripts and they were singing along while they were doing it. Um, that's the cloister again, excuse me, moving on. Here's just another example of what a music manuscript looks like, again, with a beautiful illumination. Sometimes you look at these and they're just blank. A lot of them are unfinished. The idea maybe is that they're continuing to write or maybe you leave them unfinished because everything in life is eventually unfinished. Um, and this is how they would use them. Here I have that side by side. Here is a printed hymnal and here is a music manuscript. You would hold both at the same time. And there's even this account of Israel Acrelius, who's a Swedish traveler in 1753. He visited, visits the hymnal and he says, when they sing, each one holds a notebook, meaning like a music book, as well as a psalm book, meaning a printed hymnal, which uh, both of which are quarto size, looking, in, looking into both alternately, which custom would be more difficult if the singing were not performed so regularly every day. I'm gonna read that again because the language is a little um, awkward. So when they sing, meaning they, the residents of Ephrata, each one holds a notebook as well as a psalm book, both of which are of quarto size, looking into both alternately, which custom would be more difficult if the singing were not performed so regularly every day. So just as I was saying earlier, it would be really hard to do that if they didn't already know the music or the words. And so they, they're just kind of referencing them to remind themselves of what the tune is or what the words are. Okay, um, individual ownership of these books was important. Here's an example, um, Sister Hannah, she created her own book plate in the front. And this particular one um, actually is being held at the Ephra Cloister currently. Uh, so the manuscript locations, I, over the course of my research, um, I had to find them all. 
Um, Alan Wiemeyer, who is a phenomenal historian and German and German language expert, um, he's currently at the Schwenkwalder Library, um, and he taught at Youngstown University for a long time. He created a really fantastic resource for me that gave me a lot of hints to begin with, and I was able to take what his work and run with it to create a more comprehensive catalog of all the mu the music manuscripts. Um, so. Uh, basically what happens is after the celibate brothers and sisters leave or die in the late 1700s, the music manuscripts have three possible fates. First is they get transferred to Snow Hill, which is a kind of descendant colony of Ephrata. Um, Snow Hill is in Franklin County. Um, and there are at least 30 music man Ephrata music script manuscripts that end up there. Um, since then, they've been transferred to Juniata College, and that's where they are today in Huntingdon. Um, some of them end up in family collections, so the householder communities would keep them and the manuscripts would end up in family collections and they either get transferred to libraries or archives or sometimes they go up for sale. There's still a lot of, um, you know, random estate sales or auctions that take place in, in Lancaster County and every once in a while somebody will tell me, oh, I bought a manuscript, can you tell me what it is? And sometimes it's actually an effort of music manuscript, which is very exciting. And then sometimes they're destroyed, either by humans or by nature. Um, today, there are roughly 135 extant Ephrata and Snow Hill manuscripts. Snow Hill manuscripts were basically copies of Ephrata music manuscripts, and there's a big list of where they live. Um, most of them are in the northeast of the United States. There are two in a private collection in London, and I had to go all the way there to see them, and I even had to kind of finagle my way in. I had to buy the, buy the guy lunch before he would let me see his music manuscripts, and then I was able to make photographs. <laughs> um, Oh, and, and by the way, this photo of my hand is with the largest of all the music manuscripts of Ephrata, which is called the Ephrata Codex, and it's currently in the Library of Congress. It's been there since the 1930s. Okay. Um, so Ephrata's composers, and this is where it gets fun. Um, they're members of the community, and what's interesting about them is that there's this tension at Ephrata between individual recognition and communal credit. So there's there's this idea, oh, we're all a community, the individual isn't as important. But then time and time again, you go through these manuscripts and people are being credited for their work. And you see it in different ways. Here's an example in one of the printed um, hymnals. You'll see at the top of a hymn, S and then A dash 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 A. So what that stands for is sister or schwester, and then either Athanasia or Anastasia. There were two women at the cloister whose names would begin at A and end with A. So what you're, what's being told here is like, clearly this is being credited, but nobody outside the community would know who that was. So this is an internal marker for the community saying, I see you, you wrote that, got it. Interesting that they didn't write out the name though. Um, Another way you'll see it, oh, there's the little zoom in for S, A, 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 dash, 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 A. Um, she wrote zu der Zeit, the hymn zu der Zeit. And then you'll see another example where you'll have a printed hymnal and then somebody later on would go in and write by hand who wrote which particular um, part. So for example, this hymn, uh, Bin ich hier schon gering und klein, is by Schwester Eugenia, or uh, Sister Eugenie. And then another way you'll see it is within the music manuscripts, you'll see um, authorship inscriptions. So this is the this is the effort of Codex and Library of Congress. And when I was there, I was, you know, I'm frantically trying to take photos of every page. And, and I literally, I would just go with my iPhone and take photo after photo after photo after photo, upload to a Google Drive or um, Google Images so that I could put them all into albums and then go after them later. So later, as I was going through the images, I noticed this little thing where the arrow is pointing. And I zoomed in. And I took another photo just because it's better. There you go. So that says Furbin or Phoebe. And it surprised me because I'm like, hmm, Phoebe's getting credit for something. What is she getting credit for? Is she getting credit for the writing the text? Is she getting credit for copying the notes on the page? Or is she the composer? And through a process of deduction, I determined that she was a composer. A lot of it had to do with handwriting analysis. Um, and also the text, it, it's, it's proven that the text is by somebody else um, from the community. So Phoebe would not have been given credit for work somebody else did um, for text. So therefore, she's the composer.
And that is an indication of the first known female composer in what is the United States. Obviously, women have been writing music for millennia. This is not the first female composer in America, but it's the first one we know of who received credit. And that's an important, important point. And that took place at Ephrata. So um, performing music, this is the last part of, of my little thing that I'm gonna tell you about. Um, performing music at Ephrata uh, is an interesting proposition because there's no record of how they sounded other than some contemporaneous accounts. So I'm gonna read you a few of them. Um, we only know, we, all we can tell is from the actual manuscript sources themselves or from travelers who visit it. So the first one we know is an anonymous account from 1744. I'm gonna read it to you. And I, I enjoy reading these because of the language. This, is, um, this was originally in German and it appeared in a, in a newspaper called Der Hochdeutsch uh, Pennsylvanische Geschichtsschreiber. And it says on June 23rd, while the Indians rested, our governor, with some of the other delegates and many gentlemen went out, went to Ephrata. Here they attended a singing hour of the single brethren who sang choral music in four voices. The governor and his party then visited the single sisters who also held their singing hour, singing in chorus in four voices. And it's an anonymous account from 1744. What's strange to me about that is you, you never actually see in any of the effort of music, anything written for groups of four women and four voices or four men and four voices. It's always four voices, but it's always soprano, alto, tenor, bass. So I have no idea how the men would have done that together and how the women would have done that together, considering that the music looks like it's intended for mixed choir of SATB as opposed to SSAA or TTBD. And that's something that people have been speculating about ever since they've read this particular account. What does that mean? Here's another example. Uh, Christoph Zauer, uh, who was the guy who printed the Zionetische Weihrachshügel in 1739, he wrote, in addition to the hard work of the day, they have to sign for music, not, sorry, I think that I should have said sing, sing for music, not only in four, but in six voices. So there are a few six voice settings. And what is more, all tunes composed by Beisel, which is not true. For this, they have very large handwritten books. And those who understand the art say they never heard such artful music. Obviously, this is coming from a non-musician, so I, I can't speak to what he's talking about, but it's still, it's curious. Um, number one, we don't only have four voice, voice settings, we have a few six voice settings, and that is true. But what's what's strange to me is he's crediting Beisel as the composer of everything. And what I've just told you is that he wasn't the composer of everything because Phoebe received credit for it. So there's something going on here that I can't figure out. Okay. Moving on, Israel Acrelius, he's the one I read for you before, and he's the most interesting of all of the firsthand accounts because he describes a religious service. So he describes the situation within one of the rooms of the cloister and try to use your historical imagine, imagination and try to picture this. If you've ever been there, or set yourself in a church on a hill in colonial Pennsylvania. Here you go. When they were all assembled, they sat for some moments perfectly still, in the meantime, Father Friedsam, also na named Conrad Beisel, it was the name they gave him in the community. Father Friedsam was seen to be preparing himself. He held his hands upon both his sides, threw his head up and down, his eyes hither and thither, pulled at his nose, his mouth, his nose, his neck, and finally sang in a low and fine tone. I mean, if I'm like acting this part, I'm like, mm, 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 like that's what it sounds like to me. Okay, thereupon the sisters in the gallery began to sing, the cloister brothers joined in with them, and all those who were together in the high choir united in a delightful hymn, which lasted for about a quarter of an hour. Thereupon Mueller, or Peter Miller, arose and read the third chapter of Isaiah. I mean, those of you who have been to church before know that hymns are not 15 minutes long. This hymn was 15 minutes long. And if you look at these hymnals, yeah, the hymns are like 20 verses. That's gonna take 15 minutes. Okay, here's another one. A visitor named Jacob Duché in 1770 visits the cloister. And this is when the, the cloister is definitely declining. So he comes and visits and he says, I shall at present remark 
but one thing more. With respect to the Dunkers, or the Dunkers was another word that people would give to the Ephrata um, residents because of the way they would do baptisms. Um, and that is the peculiarity of their music. Upon a hint given by my friend, the sisters invited us into their chapel and seating themselves in order began to sing one of their devout hymns. The music had little or no air or melody, but consisted of simple long notes combined in the richest harmony. The counter, treble, tenor, and bass were all sung by women, so that's, that's a surprise, I didn't expect that, with sweet, shrill, and small voices, but with a truth and exactness in the time and intonation that was admirable. It is impossible to describe to your lordship my feelings upon this occasion. The performers sat with their heads reclined, their countenances solemn and dejected, their faces pale and emaciated from their manner of living, their clothing exceeding white and quite picturesque, and their music such as thrilled to the very soul. I almost began to think myself in the world of spirits, and that the objects before me were ethereal. In short, the impression that the scene made upon my mind continued strong for many days, and I believe Leave will never be wholly obliterated. What I find interesting here as a singer is I would never want to sing with my head reclined. It's like, <laughs> like, I just don't know how they did that. And I find it a very confusing description. And then there's only one other example that I have. Um, and this is, this is somebody's memory, the guy named William Fonestock in 1835. Um, he's remembering what he had heard. And he says, music was much cultivated. Beisel was a first rate musician and composer. In composing sacred music, he took his style from the music of nature, whatever that means. And the whole comprising several large volumes are found on the tones of the Aeolian harp harmonized. I have no idea what he means by that. It is very peculiar in its style and concords and in its execution. The tones issuing from the choir imitate very soft instrumental music, I guess, um, conveying a softness and devotion almost superhuman to the auditor. So it's just an interesting, uh, you, uh, this isn't, I don't really feel like reading the rest of this description for the interest of time, but it is, it's just an interesting thing to, to think about is that we can only surmise what this music must have sounded like in practice from these five accounts that we know of. And the rest is guesswork based on the music manuscript sources. And so it was kind of daunting to create my recording. So now we're recording, we're gonna return to that soon because I didn't know really what was is correct. And that's one of the challenges we have as, as music historians is we have to try to hopefully do guesswork that will honor the, the source as opposed to move it in another direction that's not true. So those are the contemporaneous accounts. In the 1970s, uh, and a really important musicologist named Russell Getz, who led the effort of Cloister Chorus, he gets involved. He starts transcribing some of the effort of music manuscripts. So he's the first one to do so into modern notation. And um, there's a clipping from 1971, New York Times, a revolutionary romance at Pennsylvania's Effort of Cloister. By romance, we mean like a theatrical event as opposed to like a I love you romance. Um, but I, I love this picture. This is an out, they clearly did an outdoor performance. Um, and in any of you in the audience were there for this, I would love to know because I would love to know what it was like. Uh, as far as I know, there's no video or audio from this event. Um, and then in 2000, you had Lucy Carroll, um, who was another music historian. She did a lot of uh, experimenting with effort in music manuscripts and transcribing it. Um, and her, her work was very helpful to me when I was doing my, um, my research. Unfortunately, she, she passed away before she was able to really put finishing touches on her work. So a lot of my research was based on unpublished manuscripts or um, documents that she had created. Um, and then today, there's much more of a movement among music historians to be historicist, meaning we're trying to create a situation that is tr more true to the music, which makes it harder for the modern performer. Every time you're putting music from the past into a modern framework, you have to make a decision. Do I make this accessible for the largest number of people possible? Or do I try to be true to the text, in which case I alienate some of the performers? And I had to make that choice and I chose to be more true to the text because I was doing my dissertation and it had to be a very academic exercise. And I had an advisor who was breathing down my neck. Um, so here, for example, is um, one of the Effort in Music manuscripts. This is a particular um, setting of, of this kind of large thing I call the Ro Rosa Lilia Bluma sequence or the Rose Lily Flower sequence. Um, and here's my transcription of it. 
I'm including all these rests. There's no meter. Effort of music didn't have a meter. Like a lot of music will be in four, four or three, four. Um, and I elected to not do it because effort didn't, didn't have that either. So just to give you an example of what this sounds like, um, I'm going to move over to my Spotify and I'm gonna play you this first Rosa Lilia Bluma sequence. Here we go. Right there at this point. So this, the spirit and the bride speaks, come. Okay, so, um, sorry about that. There we are, good. Okay, so um, what ends up happening is this is kind of cascading effect in this music that I think is really interesting. The soprano, der Geist, the alto, und die Braut, tenor, sprechen, bass, calm. So each part has this little bit and then they all come together and they say, und wer es hört, der sprechen kommt. He who hears them, they say, come. Uh, meaning, come the bridegroom to us, save us. Um, it's a kind of exciting uh, flourishing and it's not just homophonic hymnody. You have little solo lines coming out of the texture and then coming together. And that's something that I didn't expect to find in effort of music. That was really exciting. Okay, my last thing I just wanna tell you about, um, there's also, we've been trying to reimagine uh, effort of music. So um, I was in this group, New York Polyphony for 10 years, and I worked with a composer named Greg Spears to write a new piece for us that's based on effort. We performed it a few times. Um, uh, the last time we did it was actually at the Lancaster Trust, a uh, wonderful concert venue. Um, I think that was in 2019. And uh, the idea here is that we have all of this manuscript sources. We have a number of really um, talented composers who are interested in, in historical themes. Why don't we try to update the record and include new compositions that are historically inferred or historically um, informed, excuse me. Um, and so uh, here's just an example. We, we appeared in the, in the Lititz Record Express. There's my group. Uh, with our big pink photo, that's me. Um, and uh, it, it was an interesting process to try to kind of figure out how to how to do this and how to be supposedly true to the music of Ephrata while also trying to be on the cutting edge of new music written for now. Um, and I don't know if we struck a really a compelling balance, but I think it would be interesting to see if if other composers might be interested in in getting involved um, with the reinterpretation of Ephrata music. There's so much of it. I have barely scraped the surface of Ephrata music. I've transcribed only 20 of the hymns, and I just submitted an application to the National Endowment of the Humanities to transcribe the Ephrata Codex. So um, do I want it? I don't know, um, but I'm hoping I get it because it would be helpful. And also, I, there's just so much of this music, so much of it out there, and, and we barely, barely touched on it. Um, and it's all just really rich Lancaster County music. So with that, um, I think that brings us to the end of the lecture portion. Uh, if uh, I don't know, if, Tom, am I okay? You're perfect. Yay, I timed it right, okay. <laughs> I'll take any questions. Thank you, Chris. That was, uh, that was terrific. I want to um, lead off with someone who did respond to your query, if there's anyone in the audience that was there in that early 1970s. Uh, and uh, one of our attendees says, I've been involved at the Effort of Cloisters since 1972 and participated uh, in and with the Borspiel. Is that how it's pronounced? Borspiel, uh, yeah. Uh, performances. My brother was actually in the chorus and sang in the Borspiel. The performance was preceded by a tour of the building, uh, and then there was, weather permitting, the actual performance. It was indeed a love story when one of the sisters falls in love with one of the soldiers who was part of the hospital after the Battle of Brandywine. So, oh, thanks for that context. I appreciate that. So it yeah. actually was a romance. Okay. Apparently so. Great. Yeah. yeah. There, there, you know, it's funny. Um, there are all these stories about, like, 
I don't know if, if it's us trying to live vicariously through, through celibate people, but there's a lot of intrigue about what was it like among the sisters and brothers? They surely were not celibate, right? Mm -hmm. Wasn't Conrad Weissel <laughs> sleeping with the sisters? I mean, there's there's a lot of that like speculation that goes on. Um, I guess that play is part of that. <laughs> it, it, it may very well. Yeah. Uh, so we've got one question from a, a listener. Uh, was there any evolution that you see or development in the music over the course of the years that the community existed or did it really just persist as one style, one mold? Yeah, I mean, it's hard to tell because it, um, we can't uh, we can't definitively date the manuscripts. Um, like I was able to kind of speculate the, at the date of the manuscripts, but because I can't actually put definitive dates on the manuscripts, I can't necessarily create a tr like a, a progression from one to the next. But what I was able to determine is that um, you they started writing in four part harmony, and then over the course of the settlement, they started to experiment a bit into larger larger pieces. So there is a, um, a music manuscript that I know was published at seven. 1954 because it's dated that and it's called the Paradisicious Wunderspiel and that appears I think there are seven parts in one of them and instead of setting original uh, hymn texts they actually set portions of the book of Psalms a portion of the book of Jeremiah and a portion from Revelations I believe. Okay okay so um, obviously you must have traveled through Europe uh, maybe up and down the Rhine perhaps you stopped in Eberbach and met some folks there who uh, have strong connections to folks here in, uh, in Lancaster County. Can you tell us um, whether or not there are any kind of musical traditions along that pathway in Europe that may have influenced Beisel or Phoebe or others um, with their music at Ephrata? Um. So a lot of Ephrata uh, hymnody kind of sounds like Lutheran hymnody. Um, it kind of definitely grows out of that tradition. Um, uh, we can't know what music Beisel was exposed to as a young person, and we 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 just don't know. Um, and we don't know what music uh, the brothers or sisters might have been exposed to as well. Like, it just can't be there. Um, it, it, so you can definitely, I can definitely like, I'm one hundred percent certain it grows out of a Lutheran hymn tradition. Um, but then there's this other aspect of effort of music that that grows out of something that's more esoteric, which is this thing called partimento, um, which is a method of composition developed in Europe by a number of different people over the course of the end of the 1600s, beginning of the 1700s. And it's a keyboard composition method. Um, and what you see in a lot of the effort of music manuscripts is this keyboard composition method kind of flipped on its head. So instead of it being made, uh, uh, based around the bass notes, it's based on the soprano notes, um, and and that like there's that trend as well, and that has nothing to do with Luther and hymnody. So it's kind of this mix, this mashup of these very different genres that don't really mix that well. Um, particularly if you're listening to effort of music in a minor minor mode, there's a lot of weird dissonances you don't expect, and there's no way to resolve them, and there's definitely a tension in the music as a result. Okay, I hope that answers the question. Well, I hope so too. I'm sure it did. Um, so I think one of the things that I have always found most intriguing about the effort of cloister is the architecture mm -hmm. and, and really the grandiosity of uh, the two main uh, buildings. Um, can you tell us though, whether there may have been any architectural introductions to those spaces that were acoustic in nature? So the question really is, if you look at the buildings where the music would have been performed for the most part, are there any indications that the structure uh, was designed to enhance the music? Not that I can tell. Mm -hmm. um, it was great to record, record in the space um, because it was, you know, it's more true to the, to the history. Um, but it, it, I don't think that there was any like um, in, intention to create an acoustical design. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one of the questions that uh, just came in, and it was one that I had coming into tonight's uh, uh, presentation, you have all these householders, uh, families living kind of within the community, but kind of more or less on the edges of the community. Did they participate in the musical tradition? Uh, were they picking up those hymnals? Were they part of the, the operation? 
Great question. And I, I wish I could have had time to touch on that in the, in the lecture. So I'm glad you brought it up. Um, yes, they did. Uh, you, we know that from for two different reasons. Number one, um, Israel Acrelius, he was that Swedish traveler I read quite a bit of earlier. Um, he actually talks about how um, the brothers and sisters had their own small worship services, and then they would do a weekly large service with the neighboring community. Um, so yes, the brothers, the, the householders did participate in, in the religious uh, events, not maybe not all of them, but definitely a lot of them. Okay. Um, and then in addition, what we see is brothers and sisters would also participate in text writing, and also potentially in music composition as well. There's a really curious music manuscript that's currently held at Juniata College, um, and it has names of householders as potential composers. Hmm. Um, one of them being Brother Obed, another one being a guy named um, Jacob Nagley. Uh, and so, um, and I don't know, maybe some of the descendants of those people are on, on here today. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. yeah. Uh, that's a neat thought. Um, Clearly, music is a, a pretty significant part of a long-standing Western monastic tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, and from one of the, I think, the early uh, commenters on the community, you got the impression, or I got the impression, that there was a lot of singing a lot of the time, that it wasn't something that was done on Sunday, but it was probably done on a daily basis. Yeah. Can you, now this is to kind of stretch things even beyond the effort of community, um, are there other examples as you are, you're an educator, you're working with students uh, about musical traditions. Are there other examples in pockets where there are comparable musical uh, experimentation uh, going on in the early colonies that provide any broader context for what's going on in Ephrata? Oh boy, okay, uh, that's a big one. Um, so there are a few examples I know of, um, and I'm not an expert in all in all um, vast early America music, uh, era, vast early America music. Um, but uh, through my research, I was able to interact with a Canadian scholar, um, and there's actually a, a very interesting manuscript I'd love to see someday in Quebec City. The Ursuline nuns of Quebec City, um, they in the late 1600s um, had a musical tradition. Um, it's unclear whether they actually compose music themselves, but there's definitely a music manuscript there. Um, but it seems like a lot of the composers of those of the, those pieces are actual French people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like people, the composers I've heard of uh, from France. Um, but nonetheless, it's, it's interesting that there was a tradition going on there. Um, there's also this massive tradition of, comp of composition in Latin America, in uh, Guatemala, Honduras, um, uh, Colombia, Venezuela, and, and most importantly, Mexico. Um, the colonial music tradition in Mexico was one about cultural domination and showing how opulent Spain was to the native population um, in order to, to, you know, put Catholicism uh, as, and Spanish hegemony through the, uh, the four. Um, and so that is where you see, in my opinion, some of the most interesting musical experimentation is in Mexico in the 1700s in the new world. Yeah. Well, yeah. well that, that wraps up the questions that we've got from folks. Um, you know, we've got a few minutes left though, and I don't know whether there is anything, uh, any aspect of the work, uh, the music at Ephra that you didn't have a chance to get to that you want to bring up and, and close out with, or any final thoughts that you might have for how we Lancastrians can um, appreciate even more uh, this historical tradition at Ephra. Um, well, I mean, two things I'll say is number one, uh, this is a this is a very very deep narrow pocket of history. Um, I'm, I feel very fortunate and honored to be to be um, investigating it. Um, and the 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 thing that's that's important to remember here is yes, if this is folk art, yeah, we call it folk art, which seems to to make it less than. It's not. It's very important. Um, and what's what's interesting too is that it comes out of this tradition of medieval illuminated manuscripts so you mentioned before about the monastic tradition in europe um this is very much part of that so an illuminated manuscript of Ephrata has just as much cultural weight and historical importance as an illuminated manuscript from um, a Franciscan monastery in, in Germany in the 1300s. Um, the only difference is the ones in Europe have been studied a lot and the ones here just 
haven't been. Um, and, and it's exciting to be able to, to research them because I get to interact with these historical documents and start to ask questions about the people that made them. Um, but, but I think that it kind of links us to this broader tradition. And we tend to think of, of um, you know, everything that starts in America is brand new, but it really, this, this hybridization across the Atlantic is, is, is um, a unique aspect, particularly of German Pennsylvania culture. So that's important. The other thing I'll say is a lot of these, you can actually go see them yourself. Um, it, a lot of them are online, which is great. Um, like, like the Effort of Codex, you can look at the images on the Library of Congress's website and, and spend days through like thousands of pages. Um, you can also see them in person if you want. Um, a lot of them are in Lancaster County. Uh, Franklin and Marshall College has one. Um, Effort of Cloister has several. You'd have to make an appointment and get re like request that one. Um, you guys have one at Lancaster, Lancaster, Lancaster History. I don't know if you knew that. Um, yes, uh, and it was just recently, it was found in a box by my colleague Jeff Bach, Bach in, um, and David Fuchs in 2017. So um, they come out every once in a while. I guess that's the other thing I'd say. Go into your attics and tell me if you find anything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because people find them in attics or basements, um, these effort of music manuscripts, and they don't know what they are. And if, if you, you know, if you find something, you can send me an email, and I'd be happy to tell you if it's an effort of thing, or if it's something else. Great. Yeah, or bring it in here, and we'll connect with you and uh, have you authenticate. Um, that's great a pleasure. great, or, or take it to any special collections library, certainly with Franklin Marshall has one, Elizabethtown College has one, or take it right to the source to the folks at Effort and see. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Uh, Christopher, thank you so much for your presentation tonight. Thank you for the deep dive you've done into the music of Ephrata and, and kind of helping us to uh, appreciate uh, early female composers here right in our community um, whose music we can hear today, which is pretty remarkable when you think about it. My pleasure. And I just put into the chat, I know we're going to close the Zoom very quickly, but you guys can click on the link in the chat that I just put in. And if you want to access um, my album to listen for free, you can. I get paid a few a few micro cents for every every listen. So <laughs> well, we, we like to uh, we like to support our academics. So uh, folks go out and buy those CDs and uh, listen to the music. Thanks. It's, it's, um, really, it's not a money maker. It's, it's all good. <laughs> I'm sure. I also want to thank all of you who have tuned in tonight to join us and kind of in, enlarge your appreciation for the musical tradition so close to home here. I also want to remind you that when you leave the Zoom tonight, a window is going to pop up. It's a post-event survey, and it is voluntary. We would like to know your thoughts about this program tonight and your ideas for any future uh, programming. We'd also will be posting, as was mentioned earlier, a presentation of this on our YouTube channel in the upcoming days. So tune in for that. Uh, later this month, we will be uh, releasing our upcoming spring programming. So members, you're gonna receive a booklet in the mail with those all those events uh, with exhibitions listed for January through June, 2022. Um, those will also be available online. So head to the website, lancasterhistory.org slash events. We hope to see you here in person. Um, we're open for our Yuletide tour, so stop in for that. And uh, I wanna wish each of you, including our speaker uh, tonight, a very happy holiday season, a very healthy new year. And again, thanks for joining us tonight. And Christopher, thanks again. Thank Good night, you. ladies and gentlemen. Yep.